Hey guys. Hey, um, so Gare's not here. It's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Pasadena? Yeah, right. He's watching, he's watching pregame shows. You know he is, right? Anyway, so, um, and by the way, how many of you are here for the first time? Welcome. This is a cool place. Um, Tori and I have been here uh, for, I don't know how many years now. And, but I just want to tell the people that are here for the first time, um, <clears throat> don't judge the preaching by today, okay? <laughs> I promise it's better than this. Gary will be back. Uh, is he back next week? Yeah, that'll be good. So give us another chance. All right, but <clears throat> to honor Gary, have y'all noticed that he's kind of got this thing he does every now and then where he starts out with these, these, this cheesy little list of like bad jokes? <laughs> have y'all noticed that? So, Gary, this is in your honor. I brought the psychologist jokes. Um, how many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Just one. Holds it and the world revolves around him. <laughs> a Freudian slip is when you say one thing and mean your mother. <laughs> now, <laughs> the best Freudian slip I ever heard was the guy who said, yeah, I went to the first Thanksgiving um, dinner with my in-laws and I turned to my mother-in-law and I meant to say pass the butter and I said you stupid witch you've ruined my life <laughs> just kind of slipped out um, receptionist to the psychologist uh, doctor there's a patient who, here who thinks he's invisible uh, tell him I can't see him right now <laughs> that's all my psychologist jokes I do I do have a thank you thank you thank um, <clears throat> So I do have a little appeal for empathy. I think, I, I think the last time um, I, I talked to y'all, I was in the midst of my, uh, I had almost three years where I couldn't walk, and I've had three surgeries, and now I'm up and walking again. Um, <clears throat> but it is a great, it's a great weight gain program <laughs> to not walk for three years because I got really fat. And um, anyway, I'm down 22 of it now. I'm on my way. But I have a couple of uh, things I discovered. I wrote them down here. Um, after a month of dieting, I lost 30 days. <laughs> That's about it. Let's, let's get into why we came today. Um, so how many of you have ever been betrayed or let down in a relationship? Okay. The rest of you are in denial. It just happens, right? We do get betrayed. Bad people happen to good people. Sometimes there were no signs that we could have gotten betrayed like that. Sometimes there were signs and we missed them. There's reasons for that. But sometimes um, we experience this, and it is a part of life. In fact, it was God who said, or the Bible says this, the Lord, he's looking at humans, and it says in Genesis 6, he says, so the, and he was looking at how they were hurting each other, basically. And it said that the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. You know, I read that as I was thinking about today, and I was thinking, you know what, that pretty, pretty much can express what any of us have probably felt at some time in life about someone or some scenario, I regret that I got involved with that person or that I met them or that I trusted them. And what does get us in a relationship where we can be betrayed or let down, because in some ways those are different, but we end up getting hurt, is when we make ourselves vulnerable to someone in some way that we can actually get hurt. So why would we do that? Here's why. Because if we don't, if we can't trust and we don't trust, we'll have no life. Because trust is the fuel of life. It drives everything. In fact, your system is wired psychologically, neuro 
neuro, the neurobiology, the neurology, the you know, spiritual wiring, everything about you, all the way down your spinal column, it is wired to 24-7 ask one question before any other question. And it happens all the time that you're awake and alive and asleep. Am I safe? For example, the last 30 seconds, I think you've been breathing. You know why? Because your system is ascertained. It can trust the air. But what if you got a little whiff of a gas fume? Or the air felt like it changed in some way. Some kind of signal. What would you do? You would pull back. You would hit pause. And you try to figure it out. Now, here's the problem. We're wired to do that, but we also have another wiring in life, and that is our experience in life that gives us patterns that sometimes we're wired to trust people we shouldn't trust. And we don't see it. Now, fortunately, sometimes we do, but how many of you have trusted somebody and you looked back and said, you know what, when I look back, I should have noticed that A, B, C, or D. But see, we get wired into, into patterns. I remember a woman in a group one time who said, I get it. I've been married nine times <laughs> to nine abusive, this is a true story, to nine abusive men. And, and now I'm not going to do that again. And this lady says, Mabel, shut up. You, you haven't been married to nine abusive men. You've been married to one abusive man with nine different names. <laughs> She could always find the same one somehow. So this thing, you know, that we're in this dilemma in that we were, we you're literally wired to trust biochemically. That's the way life starts. A mother and an infant, when they look and, and you're wired with these things called mirror neurons that you've all read about that some of you experienced on a date last night, Right? <laughs> You called your friend. Oh my gosh, we had such a connection. Well, that's a drug trip. <laughs> it's called oxytocin, and you were getting mirrored in some way, and that's good. Just, you know, wait till the ether wears off before you sell the farm. But we're wired to move towards people. That God put it in us because we need to connect. And if we can't trust people, our lives will be small. But sometimes, we're wired to trust the wrong ones. And today we're going to be talking about basically five things you can look for. The Bible talks about them and all of science talks about them, about how to know when I'm getting to a false yes <laughs> or when, when I may be saying no and I could trust someone. Because here's another thing, our trust muscles can be broken. If you've been wounded, there may be People right in front of me. <laughs> Tori's sitting down here. We had an experience yesterday where we were we <laughs> we were talking to this guy on the golf course, and <clears throat> we said, "So are you married?" He said, "No, you know, I got a girlfriend. Are you, are you going to marry her? I don't know. We're still trying to, to to you know kind of figure it out." And so, how long have you known her? He said, 40 years." <laughs> True story. True story. He said, "Yeah, I went to her wedding." <laughs> Anyway, they got divorced, and now, you know, they reconnected, and, and, and it turned out everybody loves her. He just can't pull the trigger. Now, I just saw five women look at their boyfriend just then. <laughs> By the way, speaking of boyfriends, have y'all noticed, like, this church is, like, where all the young, beautiful people come? Have y'all noticed that? How many of you are single in here? Okay, I want you to stand up. No, seriously, just stand up. Stand up if you're single. Yeah. All right. Woo! Okay, now, everybody, everybody look around and, and pick out the one that you want to go share the peace of the Lord with. Right, there you go. But sometimes there's this, you know, afraid, right? And our trust muscle can be broken. So we're going to hop into the science of trust and 
kind of how it works. And what I've learned over the years in studying this is there is a lot of science to this, but like all of science, that I've, I, I always get born again, 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 because I am a clinical psychologist and you know, I, in the, I hang out in the leadership and performance world. And you read this research and it's like, oh my gosh, look what they discovered. And I go, wait a minute, Solomon said that in Proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> Like, so we're going to talk about the science and also, you know, the things that God says about trust. And one of the most powerful ones that starts this is he, he does say in Proverbs 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Love, we know, is key to a very good life, but faithfulness this ability to be trusted and to look for faithfulness in the ones we trust. You put those two together and you've got love and you've got high performance and they go together. And we need to write them on our hearts. So we're gonna dive into this a little bit. You know, it's impossible to not trust, as I said, and have a big life. I was sitting on a plane, I just wrote a book on this, um, <clears throat> actually, you can, I'm really not trying to push books, but if you go on Amazon, you can pre-order it. It's coming out next month. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm sitting on a plane, you know, when I was working on it, and the guy goes, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm doing some research on trust. And he goes, huh, well, I don't trust anybody. <laughs> I said, really? He said, no. He said, I learned a long time ago, you can't trust people. He said, I only trust myself. I said, well, I'm a psychologist, and you're crazy. <laughs> so what are you talking about? I said, you know, you're psychotic. And he's looking at me like somewhere between that wasn't nice and I'm going to throw you out the window. I said, psychotic means out of touch with reality. If you tell me you don't trust anybody, you're out of touch with reality. He said, what are you talking about? I said, look outside. We're at 40,000 feet. Did you get yourself up here? <laughs> don't tell me you don't trust anybody. You're trusting a couple of people up in that cockpit that you've never even met. You trusted a guy. To, how do you know he didn't put chocolate milk in the gas tank? <laughs> you just ate the food. Don't tell me you don't trust. And your life would be really small if you didn't. But my hunch is, when I hear something like that from somebody, they have been burned in some significant personal way. And we got four hours, tell me your story. And he did. And it was true, as it always is. This trust thing is huge. So what do we need to do it well? Well, I think we need some markers. So let's jump at the first one the most important, or not the most important, but the most foundational one, it's one that underlies everything, is we trust someone when we feel and experience that they understand me. We trust when we feel understood. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, basically, this gets back to the early mirroring we talked about. It's the first thing that humans are wired with is when you have an emotion and even the preverbal child senses that mom, get, oh, you're not feeling, you know, and you hear it in the tone or they, they laugh together, this, that, and the other. She gets me and so what am I going to do? It's going to propel me towards the one that gets me and understands me and I'm going to connect and that bonding is going to even make my brain size bigger physically. It's going to change my immune system. It's going to change my body weight. I'm not going to have failure to thrive syndrome because of the connection that's basically built on first being understood. A lot of relationships go south. He comes home one day after... 10 years of marriage, and there's a note that says, I'm gone. And he's like, what? Well, he shouldn't be surprised because she's been trying to tell him for a long time. But he's gaslighting it. Well, that's not true. It's not that bad. I'm not like that. No, you, 
and negating somebody's reality instead of understanding somebody's reality because the basic connection and understanding where somebody is that makes the bridge for us to even bring them over to a different opinion if that were to be the right thing. I got called into a situation one time where the CEO and the chairman of the board of this big global entity were fighting and about to blow it up and half the board was siding with the chair and half with the CEO and <clears throat> if it blew up it would be a big deal you would know the name of it you'd read it in all the newspapers hundreds of thousands of lives would be affected and it was about to blow up so I get called in to try to facilitate this breach and trust and so we go in and we lock ourselves up in a hotel for a weekend and I started the meeting, kind of getting everybody to tell a little bit about, you know, where they were and start on the same page of facts. And it was really tense, but it was cordial. And then after the CEO and the, you know, the chairman said a few things, the CEO said a few things, and kind of back and forth for a moment. And then the chairman stops and he takes his booklet and he closes it. And he looks at the board and he says, I'm done here. You guys can have it. Good luck. And we said that, everybody knew what that meant. And the board is like, oh, oh. And everybody's kind of frozen. I didn't know what to do, and I still don't know why I did this. But he's walking out the door, and everybody's going, oh, no, the sky's going to fall in. And I got up and I ran in front of him and I sat out on the floor in front of the door. <laughs> and I think he stopped because when you see a crazy person, you don't quite know <laughs> what to do. And I said, look, you can walk out of here, but if you do, you will have set into motion some things that can't be undone. So, will you sit down for a minute? And he looks at me. I mean, this, and this is like a, big, I don't mean physically big, but a real powerful, high achieved, achieve, high achieve, highly achieved guy. Um, kind of one of those stalwarts that you would read about. And he looks at me and he goes, so he sits down. And I looked at him and I said, so I want to ask you a question. When he, and I'm pointing to the CEO, I said, when he does what he just did to you three times, what's that like for you? And he looked at me. He's about to answer, and then his chin started to quiver. This big, strong, powerful guy. He's starting to get the words out and he can barely talk as he unloads kind of what it's been like to work with this CEO over the last however long. And he's talking about it and I'm asking him, you know, to keep talking. Well, after a couple minutes, I look up and I see this, somebody's walking, it's the CEO. He's gotten up and he walks over and he sits down. <laughs> right there at the campfire. <laughs> and he reached out and he put his hand on the man's shoulder and he said, I am so sorry. I never knew that I make you feel that way. It's not what I want to do. And I looked at him and I turned to the board and I said, just keep, give me the room. We'll call you back in. So for the next hour and a half, we talked. And then the two of them stood up, went out to the foyer with the rest of the board, said, we can do this, come on in. And they put it back together. Now I wish, obviously, there was a lot more work to be done, but the point is, that is how powerful somebody just being heard and understood can do to regain trust or even to build trust. And so many times we're trying to get somebody to trust us by persuading them. Well, I didn't mean that. Or that's not what, you know, or, or no, you didn't see that right. Or you, and we're trying to persuade them into trusting. And trusting is a primarily a biological thing. 
that happens with a human connection and empathy. And as the scripture says, to answer before listening is a folly. It's not going to work. And it's a shame. A friend of mine, psychologist, we were at the hospital one day, and I said, you know, whatever you say that you don't mean, like, how's it going? And, <clears throat> I mean, we were at work, and we are busy. Hey, and he goes, you know, I had an interesting experience this morning. I said, what? And he said, my wife's out of town, and my four-year-old daughter I was trying to get her ready for, for kindergarten. I'm going, you know, get ready, so we got to leave. And then I go do something, I come back. She wasn't getting ready. And I kept going back there, get ready, get ready. I and she said, finally, I'm getting frustrated. After three or four times, she's lollygagging. And I'm getting mad, and I'm, you know, and then I caught myself, and I said, what would I do if this were one of my patients? And he thought for a second, and then he went, oh, my gosh. And he said, I got down. And I looked at her and I said, you miss your mommy, don't you? And she goes, <laughs> and she breaks apart and she falls in my arms. And he said, we cried. I miss mommy too. <laughs> and she's, he's holding his daughter and he said, after about a minute of her sobbing, all of a sudden she goes, dad, we got to go. <laughs> See, her brain starts working again. But that connection had to happen. I love the book of Hebrews where it talks about God and it says, we do not have a high priest, meaning Jesus, who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way we are, just as we are, yet without sin. He knows. We don't have a God. Every other faith, and if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're kind of checking this out, there is a lot to learn that you hadn't maybe seen or heard. I mean, I, I, when I started following Jesus, I couldn't believe how much was in there that was the opposite of what I thought. Like, I thought Christians were all judgmental. It's only three quarters of them. <laughs> and then I go to the book, and Jesus... The founder, he said, I didn't come to judge the world or condemn the world. I came to seek and to save and to heal. That was just, here is the founder that, you know, started one way and the company's doing something else, but it's not him. You know, it'd be like Elon selling gas guzzlers. Or, it's just backwards. <laughs> But here's what it says about him. That he came, see, every other faith is about us trying to somehow get to God. Except it's Jesus' faith. And the Jesus faith was the one where he came down to us. And he knows our inability. And he knows betrayal, and he knows rejection, and he knows pain. And that's one of the reasons we can trust him. We have a record of he knows how we live. Now, what we ought to be establishing in our lives with each other to be trustworthy is a record of people feeling understood by us. And then, for the ones we're going to trust, for making sure they get us as well before you trust. I just had two total knee replacements and spine surgery, and when I was looking for a surgeon, I go to this acclaimed surgeon, and he looks at my MRI and my x-ray, and he goes, yeah, he said, he said your, your knees are gone. You need two total knee replacements. You know, this is what I do, and I've looked at them, and you're done. That's what you need. He said, and he, I remember he said, anybody tells you anything else, they're wrong. And he said, I got to run. This is a true story. He did this. He said, so if you want to schedule it, you know, when you decide, I'll be glad to do it. And he walks out, and I'm going, this is like a drive-by shooting. You know? <laughs> I, I heard a, Jew, a messianic, which is a Christian Jewish comedian, <laughs> I wish I could remember his name. He said, yeah, when I grew up, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, and we had drive-by shamings, but he didn't. <laughs> I didn't say that. He said that. And it was just, it was just, and I said to him, wait a minute, you can 
diagnose that I need both of my knees replaced by just looking. He goes, yeah, that's all I need. Well, he walked out. Now, it turns out that's pretty true. In, my, in the scenario that I have, we got any orthopods in there, you know, there's some you can look at and go, dude, you need new ones. But it wasn't enough for me to trust him. So I got referred to another surgeon. He actually called me because he came through a friend. He said, yeah, I looked at your x-rays. How are you walking around? He said, that must be awful. Tell me about the pain. When did you start to feel it? How does it grow? When does, what relieves it? And tell me about how you use your knees. Tell me about your life and all of this. And I'm gradually thinking, oh, this is a lot better. <laughs> so I'm moving towards saying yes, because I feel like he got me. See, we need to know that somebody knows what hurts me, what I'm afraid of, what makes me happy, all of that. And then we start to move towards, our system opens up. So now I'm ready with Dr. Empathy to go get get my legs amputated. Right? Well, not so fast. (laughs) There's a second factor. Who's this for? What's his motive? I went to a third doctor while I'm checking all these out. And I go in there, he examines me and this, that, and the other. But all the while, and I'm trying to kind of talk to him, he's, he's bringing in residents that he's training. And he's talking about their schedule. And, you know, if we do this guy, he's got to fit into. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling like he's really not there for me. He's there for his agenda and his world. Now, he might be a great surgeon, But I'm just kind of like incidental. And you could feel this is his big world, and this is and and he's a big well-known guy. But there's a patient there. And shouldn't part of it be about me? It's my knee. But I felt like it was all about him and everything he was doing and all of all of the blah 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 blah. We don't trust somebody until we know that their agenda is to be for my well-being. Are they for me? Said another way, do they have my back when I'm not there? Are they thinking about that when they're putting a deal together, a business partner? I, I remember in my early years of business and I was doing a deal with, and I had some partners and we were doing a hospital deal, and the way it was falling out, we found out a way it could be structured that would, would be really good for us, and, and, and I took it to the partners. And I'll never forget this, and, and he was a mentor to me, and we weren't doing anything bad or illegal, but the, the other, the partners weren't, you know, in the conversation, not our partners, but people we were, had a contract with. And all of a sudden he goes, that would be good, but I don't think it would be, I just don't think it's that good for them. And there was nothing wrong with it at all. But he's sitting here thinking about the people we were doing business with and how could it be restructured in a way where it would even be better for them. Another CEO, I remember the the benefits package came in and the bids were way lower than they thought, and it budgeted. And the executive team was going, oh, this is great, we're going to save a lot of money. He said, no, we're not. We're not going to save anything. They said, yeah, it's going to be cheaper. He said, no, we had already budgeted that for our employees. We're going to give it to them in a different way. They had no union representative at the table. But he had, they had him. And a good relationship comes when both sides are looking out for the other one, that the intent and the motive is for the other one, as well as yourselves. And there's nothing wrong with having your own interests. Look what Philippians says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. 
And I like this translation because it unpacks the original language, which says, each of you should look not, at, not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. If in any relationship, it's only for the interests of others, you're getting crucified. Because that's the only time that worked. <laughs> yeah. Or you're codependent. I mean, every relationship, all the stakeholders, excuse me, stakeholders have needs and everybody's got to make their needs work. But the bad ones are the ones where only one person's needs matter. When the marriage is supposed to bend its knee to only his agenda or her agenda, that's not a relationship. So the second one is, are we being someone that the people who have invested and trusted in me know that I'm going to be looking out for them in everything that we're doing. Does a husband and wife feel that way? Like if he says yes to this or schedules this or she does that or whatever, do they have it in their mind? Well, I wonder how he's going to feel about that. What's going to do to his or her schedule or how's this going to... See, it's about carrying somebody else's needs around with us and being the steward and the protector of those for them. That's the second factor. I called the second surgeon, the one I talked to in the conversation about that he actually seemed like he heard and understood me. He also said, and I've, you know, I've heard about you. I got some friends. He said, I know you've been a competitive golfer your whole life. We got to get you back out on the golf course. How long has it been since you played? And I said, I can't. I can't even walk. He says, yeah. He said, dude, you got a lot of tournaments in front of you. We got to do this. And he said, he said, don't you? Hadn't you got two daughters? Or I said, yeah, they're 20 and 22. And, and he said, you know, you want to be able to, like, go on trips and walk with them. And, and they're going to be having kids. I go, slow down, dude. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but one day, yeah, he said, you're going to want to play with your grandkids. He said, we got to fix this thing. All of a sudden, I was feeling like he's looking out for my life. It wasn't all about him. So now I got doctor understanding and doctor looking out for me on my team. Let's go amputate my legs. <laughs> well, not so fast, trusting breath. <laughs> what if doctor understanding, doctor empathy, and doctor I'm all for you says, okay, let's get up and go schedule this. He said, I'm so excited about doing your knee replacement because I'm an OB-GYN and I've never done one. <laughs> I've always, since medical school, I've wanted to do a knee replacement. <laughs> See, it doesn't just end with somebody being a good person. <laughs> I'd, I'd want specialties in a different area than he specializes in. The third one is does this person have the ability and the competency, the capacity to pull off what I'm entrusting to them? And that changes in contexts, right? I had a friend that called me and said, I need some advice. And I said, what? And he said, well, my daughter's boyfriend called me. <laughs> and he said, I know what this means. They've been dating for, you know, a year or so. You, you would think... Did your speaker have the competency to turn off their stupid phone <laughs> before? Or that Apple would have the ability for that to kill. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. He said, the boyfriend, I know what's going to happen. He's going to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage. He said, how do you do that dinner? He said, what, do, you know, what would you say? I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to say. He said, what? And I said, I'm going to talk to him and, and listen. I said, yeah, let's meet again. And I want, this time I want you to bring your last two years tax returns and your credit report. <laughs> and he starts laughing. He goes, yeah, right. And I said, I'm not joking. <laughs> he said, that's so intrusive. How can, I said, look, I don't, I'm not trying to be intrusive. I don't care about the numbers. He can white them out. That's not what I care about. What I care about, can he find them? Do they exist? <laughs> Secondly, his credit report. I know people have 
things happen and credit can get better, but there's always a story to that. But there better be a story if it is, because I want to know how has he performed for other people that gave him treasure that he promised to perform for before I give him my treasure? yes to my daughter are you kidding me I want to know see this is probably a fantastic young man who's very empathic understanding probably has great motives but does he have the ability to do what the context of being a husband and a father is going to require doesn't mean he's bad if he doesn't. He may be Mr. Right, but he may be Mr. Not Right now. Maybe there's some competency. See, when we trust somebody in different contexts, I have people that are really good friends, but they're total idiots. <laughs> and, I mean, they're, I, I, I have great parties with them, but if I got to entrust some area of life, I call a different friend. That doesn't mean that I don't trust the other ones, but there are specific contexts. When we're going to invest in somebody and hope not to be disappointed, do they have the ability to pull off the context that I'm asking them to pull off? I remember I got called into a company one time and they said, I want you to do some CEO coaching. I said, what's the problem? So said, we have a new CEO about a year and morale is down, and they're kind of, you know, they're drifting a little bit, and he just needs some coaching because he's only been in the role for a year, and it's just not as good as we want it. I said, well, how did he become the CEO? And they said, well, he was our COO, and we promoted him. And they said, I said, how did he do as a COO? They said, he's fantastic. He was there for 10 years. Everybody loves him. He's the greatest guy ever. He changed, I mean, he he. He opened up like new distribution channels and, and fixed the supply chain, all these stuff he did that was incredible. So we promoted him. I said, from COO to CEO. And they said, yes. I said, where did he get the E? And they said, what? And I said, where did he get the E? I said, what are you talking about? I said, he was the COO, operations, and you made him the CEO, executive chief executive, where did he get the E? He had an O, where did he get the E? Obviously the O worked well, where did he get the E? <laughs> they said, well, we promoted him. I said, I know that, but where did he get the E chip? Because what I hear is a guy in the CEO chair who's operating as an operator and not a CEO. He's not doing the things that CEOs do well. And we can probably coach to those, but I think that's your problem. So when you're thinking about trusting someone, you know where people do this a lot? A couple of places, family businesses. Just because somebody's got, you know, the right lucky sperm club or something, you're in the family, then they're going to be whatever but they really don't have the competency for that position. Then the family gets all you know, upside down and in conflicts. And these abilities to trust somebody have got to be developed. I'll tell you another place it happens. When friends who are awesome friends and you trust them with your life, you say, Wouldn't it be, we should start a business together. <laughs> They're a great friend, but you find out a year later, they suck as a business partner. <laughs> How many of you have had that experience in another life? Or, okay, so we're not making this up. It's just so common because we want to trust good people and we can trust good people for the right things. So the third point is when people are trusting us, first of all, we need to know our lanes, <laughs> what we are able to do well and should say yes when somebody wants to trust us and the things we should say no at. Like my wife sitting right down here, she won't allow me to go to the grocery store. <laughs> right? I suck. I don't have the ability to come home with the right thing. 
Even after FaceTime, somehow I get it wrong. <clears throat> and I have the ability to come home with mass quantities of crap that she does not allow in our house. So she doesn't trust me in that way. She trusts me in other ways. But we need to learn how to say, but, but, and I say this all the time, people ask me to do something, I go, you know what, I'm really not very good at that. If you need this, I could probably pull that off. So let's, let's know, you know, Ephesians 2 says, you're God's workmanship created in him for good works that have been laid down beforehand so that you should walk in them. In other words, God's made you for specific things, and those are your strengths, and let's not let people down. Let's be competent. They need us to show up and be confident. As Proverbs says, where is um, my proverb about uh, being, ah, do you see someone skilled in their work? They'll serve before kings. They'll not serve before officials of low rank. In other words, they will get entrusted with really good things and big things because they've developed abilities that can be trusted. And God calls us to do that. You know what's really cool? We look at Jesus. What have we got? We've got somebody that came down to our level and he understands us. We've got somebody whose motive was for us. Read Romans 8, which says, in the same way, he helps us in our weaknesses. He's so for us, it says, we don't even know how we ought to pray, but he's praying for us with groans too deep for words. And then the next part of it says, and he who searches our hearts, he knows the mind of the spirit because he intercedes for the th saints according to God's will. You're in struggles and God is so for you. He's already ordering the right things that are going to be needed to help us get to the next place. And at the end of the passage, it says that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to purposes. And you know, you can depend on this. God is for you. He's for you. Again, how many married your prom date? Anybody in here marry their prom date? Okay, one couple. Is this him? <laughs> hey, in my line of work, you got to always ask. <clears throat> okay, can you guys stand up? <laughs> Look at this. They're smiling. Look at them grabbing each other's hand. Get a room, guys. Come on. Thank you. See, they stand up. What, we're celebrating it, right? It worked, which proves you can go to Vegas and put it all on red. And sometimes you win, but that's the exception, people, because <laughs> they turned out to be the real thing, and they knew it early on. But the point I want to make here is a lot of you went to the prom, and how many of you, are, instead of we're congratulating you, you're saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I, raise that hand. That you're not married to your prom date. How many of you are so glad and yet when they broke up with you, it was the worst thing that ever happened to you. But God knew, trust me, I, you dodged a bullet here. I got your back. <laughs> I got another one down the road. Or when you win a job or a career or there's something. See, things fall apart all the time. But we know that there is a God who is thinking about us even when things are going so badly that we think there is no way he can be thinking about me or my dream would have come true. And we don't know he knows better than we do. And we can trust him. So, Dr. Competent, he cared about me, he's for me. He's not an OB-GYN. He does a thousand of these a year. In fact, he even invented the implants holds the patents on him. He flies out here. He's from another part of the country. He trains surgeons at SC and UCLA, and he's very competent. So I'm ready, right? Let's go. Okay, Doc, let's go. He said, you know what? If you, um, 
you got a few minutes or you got an hour? I go, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to do one right now, like yours, and we got a theater in the operating room if you want to watch. Now, maybe now, after I've been through it, but I don't, I don't think I would want to watch it before I went through it. But if you did that and you go watch and you're watching this knee replacement, what if you got there and you're watching and, you know, they prep the dude and his knee's sticking up there and he's obviously out and all of a sudden the surgeon starts cutting and, and he's about 10 minutes into it. You're going, man, isn't he good? And all of a sudden, he, oh crap, he's bleeding. Oh no. And the surgeon gets freaked out because he's bleeding. Well, doctor, understanding good motive, competent, is lacking the fourth thing that I need to trust him. And that's the character <laughs> to be able to pull it off for what I'm asking him to pull off. Because surgery requires somebody with a certain kind of makeup that can think under stress and react and respond. Now, I don't mean character, just moral character. Mor you can't trust people that lie, cheat, or steal. That's not what we're talking about. That's character, that's for five-year-olds. But you don't trust, I mean, our daughters knew how to not lie, cheat, and steal when they were five years old. They weren't ready to do knee replacements. The makeup of this character has got to be very different. And it's always different for what we're entrusting somebody with. We had a brother-in-law who's a Navy SEAL, and Mark was the brother I never had. Um, incredible guy. We lost him. In Iraq, in 08. And Mark was incredible. He'd come home from from being deployed, and I'd say, Mark, tell me a Mark story. Well, we jumped out of a plane at 40,000 feet above the oxygen level and took our tanks down, hit the water, and went down to the bottom and changed clothes and took a nap because we had been up for a couple of days. And then we, six of us, boarded one of Saddam Hussein's ships, and, you know, we took it down. We turned it around. We took it to the holding station, and then we had breakfast. <laughs> Just another day. The courage and the makeup of these guys, what they pull off, it's incredible. And here's what's interesting. When Mark and Sarah got married, I did the ceremony, but I had somebody else do the premarital counseling, and they gave them each these assessments, these tests, and the guy yeah, gave them the test, sat him down, and he said, y'all both flunked the sympathy scale. Who's going to be nice in this marriage? <laughs> And they all laughed, and we all laughed, because they're both, you know, really thick skin, pretty tough. They did great. But it was kind of funny. But I'm sitting there also thinking, you know, that's why in my dark night of the soul, if I'm, you know, needing to cry to somebody, I'm not calling Mark. Because he'd come in and say, suck it up. Let's go get some beers. You know, he'd, he'd like, but if the bad guys are coming after me, I'm calling Mark. Now, I got other friends who are very caring and empathic, and I probably would call them because they would understand the pain I'm going through. But if the bad guys are coming at me, I'm not calling that wuss. <laughs> and see, God has given us a body where everybody's got different gifts and makeup. You look at a Netflix movie, you freeze the frames, and you see somebody operating in one scene. Well, there's a character arc to that. And each of us have our own makeup. And we want to be as integrated and whole and complete as we can, but I'll never be a mark. But I don't know if Mark would be the guy that would go sit down in front of this global chairman of a board and get him to cry. You know, we all have different abilities and gifts. So when you're trusting somebody for a specific context, you got to look at their makeup. And does it fit what we're trusting? And if somebody's trusting us, what if they're trusting us to do something that we know, I could do that for a day, but I can't pull that off for a year. That's not me. We are really clear about how we're going to trust and who we're going to trust. Because when it goes the other way, it looks like this, like a broken tooth or a lame foot is reliance 
on an unfaithful person in a time of trouble, I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to be a broken tooth or a lame foot to somebody. So in our relationships, we've got to be asking the question, am I understanding them? Do they know I'm for them? Do I have the ability to do this? And am I bringing the courage or the compassion or the love or the kindness or whatever character trait is needed for that relationship? And we flip it around. When we're trusting somebody, is that makeup there? Particularly in significant relationships. So now we got the doctor. I I care about you. I'm for you. I'm competent. I'm not afraid of blood. Okay, let's go do this. So we're going to go schedule the surgery. I'm walking to the front desk to schedule it. I stop. There's this body line in the floor that's kind of gray blue. That means they're dead. It's a color of dead people. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I go like this. I go, what's that? And the doctor goes, yeah, I did his knee last week. It didn't turn out so well. <laughs> the fifth one is, what's the track record? The best predictor of the future is always the past, unless something has changed. And then if something's changed and they've really changed and there's a track record of seeing the change, the best predictor of the future is still the past. They've just gotten a new past. (laughs) Because now we've seen a year of different performance. So I want you to trust people sometimes that screw up who say, I'm sorry. But you don't trust them because they say, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. That opens the door to when they can start building the trust that would then cause the investment. A lot of people make that mistake. So we had to see a track record. Tori and I were down in South Louisiana before GPS on your phones, visiting a friend, and they live in the swamps down there. And, and we, we you know, got this address, and there's no GPS, and we stop at the gas station. And I said, um, can you tell me how to get to this address? And the lady goes, oh, yeah, it's not too far. You go down, go down a little ways few miles, I don't know how many, a few miles down this road, and you, you'll see a German shepherd lying in the grass, and when you see that German shepherd, just turn right, it'll be right there. I said, a German shepherd lying in the grass, that's my sign. She goes, yeah, he'll be there. I said, well, what if he's, she goes, he'll be there. I knew I wasn't talking her out of it, but I'm like wanting a sign that doesn't chase cats or something. So we get in the car, and we start driving, and we drive, and we drive, and all of a sudden, there's a German shepherd lying in the grass, and we turned right, and we found it. How did she know? How did she know that that dog would be there? Because the dog's got a track record. He's been there every day for probably 10 years. And see, he can be trusted. Some of you start meetings at 8 o'clock, and if, if... Mary's not there. You go, hold on, we'll we'll wait for Mary. Why do you wait for Mary? Because Mary's always on time. And you know something's wrong. She'll be there. And if she's not there by 8 after, 10 after, everybody's going, I wonder what happened to Mary. You're calling her. Why? Because she's got a track record. But in a different meeting, if Joey's not there at 5 after, you go, let's start. Why? Because you know Joey's always late. You can't depend on him for being on time at all. See, everybody is making a mental map of you in every interaction. And that's telling them whether or not they can trust you the next time. Because that's how our brains are designed. So that's why look at somebody's track record. And it's okay if it's not good. In fact, God made some stellar high-performance superstars out of people with horrible track records. That's the business he's in. And thank God he does because at least I had a chance. And many of you know that. What your lives look like before Jesus entered them. He uses and trusts broken people. But he enters in, he starts to develop them, and as they're faithful in little, 
they get more. And that's how we've got to be. That when somebody has a track record, we start to give more. Don't give the farm the first night. And then there's our God. I'll give thanks to the Lord with all of my heart. And I'll recount your wonders. And then it says right after that, that he's known by the justice he brings and the wicked are ensnared by the work of their own hands. And throughout the Bible, you will see one thing said about God over and over and over and over and over. Look at his track record. You were slaves in Egypt and I brought you out. You thought I was dead and I came back from the dead. You thought it was all over, but I told you I would come and start a movement that would go around the world and on and on and on. And hopefully, hopefully some of you have that kind of track record with God where you've seen the lights go out. There's a power failure, but then they came back on because he showed up in a way that you didn't expect and you can learn to trust him. Some of you might just be ready to give him the chance to start a track record. And that's that first step. And some of you may just be exploring. And if you are, one of the things we do whenever we're going to enter into a relationship, we ask people that know that person. And one of the best things that helped me when I was exploring faith was to talk to people who had known Jesus for a long time. And I got some good referrals. (laughs) And I think a lot of us How many of you have known him for a long time and found him to be trustworthy? Let me see your hands. Because some of you want to know that. And that's a good question for you to be asking. So in some couple of things, be careful who you trust. (laughs) I hope I've scared the hell out of you today. (laughs) But I hope I've given hope that there's some worth trusting and some ways in which you can identify it. And by the way, some of you have been burned in churches. They go, well, you can't believe Christianity because, you know, I went to church and I got burned. I go, did you read the book? The book says, if you go, the Bible says, if you go to church, there will be some bad people there and they will hurt you and stay away from them. That's what the book says. God's not a good marketer. He tells you there's side effects. (laughs) But there's some good ones. So we have a God we can trust, but let's also be people who are trustworthy and let's be careful about the ones we trust. God bless you guys.